Now, it was pretty small and unremarkable in and of itself. But the thing is, it was just the first of many. And the discoveries just kept on coming. And we've now discovered well over a thousand of these trans-Neptunian objects, <laughs> or TNOs, things out past Neptune. Uh, and we really think that's the tip of the iceberg. We expect to find millions of these objects in a part of our solar system that we now call the Kuiper Belt. Now, the thing about a lot of these objects that we're finding is that many of them are a lot like Pluto. Their orbits don't tend to be that round. Um, they're tilted with respect to the inner solar system, many of them. So, you know, we used to think of Pluto as an oddball planet, but now we're beginning to recognize it as the first known member of perhaps millions of members of the Kuiper Belt. It's rewritten the book on this part of our solar system. And together, all these new objects are hinting at something even more remarkable way out there past Neptune. Now, the sizes of these objects we've been finding vary pretty widely from tens of kilometers across to about 2,400 kilometers roughly the size of Chicago to the size of Western Europe. Some of the largest of these objects have been discovered by Dr. Michael Brown at Caltech and his colleagues. And we're gonna have a little visit now with Dr. Brown at the historic Palomar Observatory in Southern California. Finding new objects in the solar system is in principle simple. Take a picture of a patch of sky, come back, take another picture of the same patch of sky an hour later. All of the stars, all of the galaxies and nebulae will be in exactly the same place relative to each other. Anything that moves is part of the solar system. The real trick is being able to search the entire sky. By the early 2000s, we attached what was then the largest astronomical camera in the world to the Palomar 48-inch telescope, which could be used robotically night after night after night to scan the skies. Even with this amazing machine, it still took us nearly five years to take enough images to cover the night sky. We couldn't just take pictures, of course. We had to analyze them to find out what was moving. Every night, the telescope beamed the most recent batch of images over the microwave link back to my computer in Pasadena, which churned away, comparing each point of light, each star, each galaxy, to see what might be changing. The computer just made the first pass at the data, though. Every morning, I would wake up, go into the office, and sift through what the computer thought it had found from the night before. I went through hundreds of camera glitches, dust motes, atmospheric disturbances, and who knows what else, each day, looking for one of the elusive images that showed something real, a new world in the outer part of the solar system. One morning, while scanning through data, I saw three images flash across my screen, and there was an object unmistakably real and brighter than almost anything else we'd ever seen, moving very slowly across the screen. I almost fell out of my chair. The speed that something moves across the sky tells us instantly how far away it is. Things that are close move really fast. Asteroids go zipping across the screen. Meteors make streaks even. And of course, there are airplanes landing just down the mountain at the San Diego airport. But this object was moving slowly more slowly than anything we had ever seen. I immediately knew that it, the object that we now call Eris, was the most distant object we had ever seen in the solar system. That very day, I sent an email to Chad Trujillo in Hawaii and David Rabinowitz at Yale, the other two astronomers I was working with, saying, hey, we just discovered something that is at least as big as Pluto, but it might even be as big as Mars. It's funny that we couldn't tell how big it was, but the telescope didn't have the power to resolve the size of Eris. We were just measuring how much sunlight was reflecting off of the surface of the object. The same amount of sunlight is reflected off of a very large dark surface as a tiny icy surface. We didn't know which one we were looking at. We needed the sharpest views available. So we wrote a quick proposal to the director of the Hubble Space Telescope essentially saying, so, hey, you know, we, we found something and it's as big as Pluto or maybe bigger. Will you take a picture of it with your telescope? And they said, uh, yeah. So they took this picture and we thought, well, we didn't quite know what to think. We thought it might be big. It might show continents. It might show mountains. 
And uh, here's the picture we got. Eris is small. It's about the same size as Pluto, which also means that to be so bright, it has to be incredibly reflective. How reflective? Eris reflects an astounding 97% of the light it gets from the sun. By comparison, freshly fallen snow only reflects about 75%. How is it so reflective? Our best guess is that when Eris is closer to the sun, it has a nitrogen atmosphere like Pluto, but when its orbit takes it further away, that atmosphere freezes out, leaving behind a layer of fresh, highly reflective nitrogen frost. Then we discovered Dysonomia, a moon orbiting Eris. The great thing about having a moon is that it lets you weigh the object it is orbiting. The faster the moon goes around a body, the more the body weighs. Even though Eris is the same size as Pluto, we now know that it weighs about 28% more. Eris is the Pluto killer, the object that forced us all to rethink our ideas of what a planet is. Eris is the most massive of a number of large objects discovered in the Kuiper Belt. Let's bring some of these larger objects closer to compare them. object beyond Neptune that a robotic spacecraft has visited. All of the other images are artists' conception, our best guess of what these dwarf planets might look like. Pluto, we now know to be a bizarre world with nitrogen glaciers, massive water ice moons, and a hazy atmosphere. Eris, which we just visited, is extremely reflective. Maki Maki is about two-thirds the size of Pluto and Eris and is covered in thick slabs of frozen methane. Quarwar seems to be a strange hybrid between the cratered plains of Sharon and the exotic ices of Pluto. Orcus and Banth are perhaps a miniature version of the Pluto-Sharon system. This object 2007 OR10 was originally nicknamed Snow White because we thought it would be one of the brightest, whitest objects in the outer solar system. Now we know it's red and dark, but it doesn't have a better nickname yet. Sedna has a particularly strange orbit that tells an amazing story about the distant solar system. Haumea is really wild with its odd shape and fast rotation it deserves a closer look. Right when we discovered Haumea, we noticed that it changes in brightness. It would get brighter, then fainter, brighter, then fainter every two hours. It didn't make sense for it to be rotating that fast. If it was rotating every two hours, it wouldn't be able to hold itself together. It would fly apart. What did make sense was that it was shaped like a squashed egg and rotating every four hours. It shows its long side, then short side, long side, then short side.